Thank you guys. That was excellent. Well, it's been a very long time since I have said these words. I hope I say them right. It's been about a year since we have had Haven kids. But I have very, very exciting news for you. If you're in kindergarten through uh, fifth grade, thank you, fifth grade. If you're in kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, then Uncle Drew is waiting for you in the back to take you on an adventure of your lifetime. I may be overselling this, but no, for real. Haven Kids, <laughs> Haven Kids today, back in action, Uncle Drew. So if you are a, in elementary and you are interested in learning about Jesus and playing with your friends and hanging out with the amazing Uncle Drew, um, uh, then you can go ahead and make your way that way right now. And moms and dads, I, 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 I promise uh, Uncle Drew is very safe, and there's lots of very safe people back there. So your, your, your child will be very safe, and we will see you guys uh, shortly, sooner rather than, than, than later. <laughs> there, there is a, a wonderful and yet sad thing about coming to the end of a series, or a journey, per se, as we've been saying. We have been on a journey together for the past several weeks talking about this main thing, which I think is one of the most important things in considering uh, any kind of religion, any kind of philosophical system. It, it behooves us to know the, the main character. And so we've been spending a lot of time the past several weeks under the guise of this single uh, phrase, knowing God and what that means and what that looks like. And we've been looking at a variety of his attributes and trying to understand how he has revealed himself to us. And I think we've seen a lot of different exciting things. And now as we bring this portion or this series to a close, I think we will look at probably what has become one of my favorite things about the God of the Bible. I think that it is wonderful uh, to know that he is wise and he is just, and that he is loving, and all of those things complete him in his, all of his perfections. But there's just one thing that's just very near and dear to my own heart in particular, and I think it will be for you too. And so on our last part of this series, we're going to concentrate on another massive theme in which the Bible talks about this God, and that is this, that this God is a good father. What is a good father? Now, the chances are there are lots of different definitions and adjectives being floating around in the air right now when such a question like that is asked. And it's interesting to look at the historical pr progression or perspective of what was considered a good father. You know, back in the early frontier days, European American, European slash Americans really contributed a man or a male being a good father based on their ability to teach moral uprightness to their children. I mean, that was the primary qualification of a good father versus not a good father. And so the scriptures were taught their kids. Aesop's fables were taught to their kids. All kinds of American folklore that would somehow turn the children of the father into, a good, into good people in general. If the man was willing to do that, he was deemed a good father. But then a fascinating shift occurs around the time of the industrial period. Right at the, the, the peak of, before the Depression, essentially, when, when the industry was everything and progress was king, in America in particular, something happened. The father, the pr primary role of the father goes from being moral teacher, moral instructor, instructor of their children, to primary breadwinner. So to be a good father literally meant you brought more food to the table than another individual or another person or any other father. Fatherhood was defined by your ability to be the breadwinner. So it goes from moral teacher to breadwinner, and then progressively it changed again, making another shift in the past several decades from not, not prim the father's primary responsibility, if he's going to be good, is not training his kids in morality, and it's not necessarily breadwinning, it's investing his time and energy in his family. It's being at home. And very much, and very, very, particular, it's playing with the kids. It's being the roughhouse monster, you know, the tickled alien. I made that up. But, you know, you know, it's being the fun person. It's being that kind of person for your children. P 
people look at that, cinema has been depicting it, like that is a good father. And it's interesting to see the various shifts from all of those different perspectives throughout the course of the past hundred years plus. And I think what's interesting is all of those things we could say at minimum, a good father probably has all of those different elements. Wouldn't you agree? Does a good, is a good father someone who protects their children, teaching them right from wrong? More importantly, modeling right from wrong? Isn't that an aspect of a good father? Isn't an aspect of a father being a provider? Not necessarily being the financial breadwinner, but is providing some kind of emotional support, financial support, stability to the household. I think we would all agree that being a good father involves being a provider. And I think we would all agree that a good father is someone who plays with their kids, who likes them, who entertains them, who gets down on their level to give them horseyback rides, who plays Spider-Man you know, with them, who watches Disney movies with them. We would all say, I think all of those different components, while they've been highlighted primarily as sole features of a good father, I think there's warrant to saying all of those different aspects contribute to what we would consider a good father. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but let's say this. A good father is someone who protects, provides, and plays with their kids and family. Is that fair? Is that a fair working definition? Obviously not exhaustive, but I think, nevertheless, it really hits home to some aspects that we value and cherish and want to be willing to say, that is a good father. Now, if it's, it's possible that if you're like me, it's impossible, <laughs> sorry, if you're like me, it's impossible to begin to think and talk about the idea of a father without reflecting on your own father. It's absolutely impossible. And immediately when we go through those three different categories of the working definition that we have, immediately what we start doing in our brains, maybe not you, but me for certain, I begin to think through how did my dad really nail some of those categories? And at the same time, how did my dad maybe not do so well at those categories? Is it like that for you as well? Because here's the reality. The father relationship with his children on a human level is one of the most formative relationships that a child will have. So much so that we go through life with the scars of things that our father has done or not done that we really needed as children. Why? Because the relationship is so formative. I mean, we can, we can say it like this in another way. We could say it like this. When we begin to think about and reflect about human fathers, immediately we begin to internalize and personalize our relationship with our own father. And we begin to cherish what he did really well. We begin to reflect and have joyful thoughts about what he did really well, but at the same time, we begin to mourn how he fell short. Now, this is not a mathematical equation. There's a different gradient to all of these things. But at the end of the day, when we think about our own fathers, matched to a definition of what a good father is, we are always pinched between two different polar op obstacles. We're, coming, we're trying to come to terms with the father that we have, and at the same time, we are longing for a father that we never had, that we never got to experience. Again, it's not a mathematical equation, but all of us fall into those different polar opposites when we think about our own father. And here's the kicker. If our human father relationship to us is that formative, then how much more, if God is really our father, a father, how much more formative would our relationship with him be? How greater an impact would that have on the formation of our lives going forward? that interaction between us and him. And, and here's the thing. If God is not just a father, but God is a good father, like, what does that mean? At minimum, it would mean this. It would mean that he protects his children with an infinite strength, with an infinite ability. He protects his children. He would provide them. He would provide for them the same way that he, he provides for the flowers and birds of the field. And in a very real way, he also would interact or play with his children. 
He would call us to join in with him in what he's doing in the world. He doesn't need anyone or anyone, any, any, any person to interact with what he's doing in the world, but he invites us in. Almost as if he's saying, hey, come play over here with me and watch what I'm doing and do it with me. If God is a good father, then he would exhibit all of those different characteristics. But listen, I understand that it's hard for us to conceive of a divine being, you know, being a good father. It's easier if he's a grumpy old man or a bully on the playground or Santa Claus in the sky or, or you know, some other caricature. But those things are, in a sense, easier because in, in, in a real way, we have, we have more of a category for that than a divine being who honestly, infinitely, passionately loves and cares for us and wants to protect and provide and play with us. That's a mind-blowing category. One so much so that I would argue no human being could invent a God like that. And you remember what C.S. Lewis said about people inventing gods. Human beings invent the easy gods. It's the complicated gods that human beings can't invent. And so what we have here in the scriptures is the God of the Bible who says, I am a father to my children, and I'm not just a father, rather, I'm a good father. And nowhere else in the scriptures, let me phrase it like this. I have a terrible habit every, every week of saying, oh, I just love this passage so much, which is true, right? It's not a lie, but listen to me. Listen, and mark it down. Take it to the bank. Six ways to Sunday, this is true. I just learned that phrase, B.S. <laughs> this passage in Luke 15 probably is the most revolutionary piece of scripture I've ever read in my life. It has changed everything about me. And ultimately, one of the reasons why is because what we're talking about. It very clearly, in an incredibly provocative way, is going to explain the heart of God as a good father. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. And then time out for a second. Now, normally I would re we would have our scripture reading beforehand, but this is so imperative that we follow what is, what is being written, that we're, actually, we're just going to go through it together. We're going to experience the story as it unfolds together. But let me set it up like this. Look at verse 1. Or I'm not setting it up. I'm sorry. Luke is setting it up like this. Look at verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. What's so interesting about this particular scenario is that there are two groups of people that are surrounding Jesus. You have the tax collectors and sinners being one category. So you're outcasts, you're outliers, you're uh, rebellious you know, to, to society type people. Then you have the nice, clean religious people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders on the other side. So you have both of these groups who have an idea of what God as a father should be or would be, and they're gathered around Jesus, and it's in response to what the religious people are saying about Jesus that Jesus responds by telling them a story, and it's a wonderful story. And typically, it's a very famous story. We, we call it the prodigal son, typically. Prodigal meaning reckless or useless son. But what's interesting about this story in particular is that it begins to mirror the actual crowds that are standing around Jesus in real time when he's telling the story. So one of the things I want you to watch and look for as we're going through this together is which character is this portraying of the people, the sinners and tax collectors that are hanging, around, hanging out around Jesus, or the religious, know-it-all, perfect people that are hanging around Jesus? Both of them are. And the characters will reflect that very deeply in the story. So while Jesus is responding to them, he's responding to them in a, in a, in a narrative way, which is just brilliant and beautiful and incredibly, incredibly powerful. So they make their comment about him hanging out with sinners. And then in verse, in verse 11, skip down to verse 11, he looks at them after telling two other stories. He looks at them and he says this. He said, there was a man who had two sons. Here's the question I want us to wrestle with as Jesus begins to unpack this story for us. If God really is a good father, that's one thing. It's another thing 
if it gives you an incredible amount of value. And I think it does. And I think Jesus thinks it does. So here's the question I want you to wrestle with as we're going through this today. As you're identifying which character is a witch, here's the meta question. It's this. What value? What value is it to me if God is a good father? No, knowing, him, knowing him in theory that he's a good father is one thing. But what value would that bring to you right now today, this afternoon, as you sit in those chairs? And as I stand here, Let's pray, and then we'll jump right in. Lord, I'm so thankful and humbled by this text. Would you do your thing? And would you make your son more real and more beautiful to us today than he's ever been before? Father, would you be our only teacher? Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. But would you be the hero of the story that you were writing? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story has three acts in particular, so that's how we're going to break it down. In Act 1, it deals with a younger son who is pursuing a life away from his father. Look, look what Jesus says in verse 12. He says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, this phrase, this idea, Father, give me my inheritance, is so unbelievably provocative. You know, just like as in today, in the, in the first century in, in Judaism, you didn't get your inheritance until the, the, the person with the goods passed away. So in essence, in a very, very, very abruptly evil manner, the younger son is going to the father and saying, Father, I wish that you were dead. Why? So that I can get what I really want from you. Your money. Give me my state of the inheritance. But, but see, that's not even the massive surprise of the story so far. We just got started. You know what the biggest surprise of the whole story is? The father says, okay. Look at the end of that verse that we just read. And he divided his property, verse 12, between them. Now, that them is incre incredibly important because here's the deal. In the ancient, in the first century Jewish culture, you couldn't give just one of the kids their inheritance. So it's like, well, you're, you're, you're going to get a third, so here, let me give you your third now, and then, you know, we'll, we'll grow the other one for, the, for the, the other siblings. No, no, that's not how it worked. Either everyone got their inheritance at one time, or just one child, then no one got their inheritance. And so when he breaks the inheritance, he gives it to all of them according, meaning the father technically literally has nothing left. Everything he owns or did own now belongs to the eldest brother, which we'll get to in a little bit later, because that's even more of a gut punch. I don't know, sorry, couldn't think of anything. So then what happens after that? Immediately after he gets the inheritance in verse 13, the younger son makes, he abs absolutely doesn't hesitate one bit whatsoever. He begins to set sail for his idea of freedom. Like, there is no more better depiction, I think, of a modern person than this idea of the younger son here in Luke chapter 15, written s several thousand years ago. It just shows how much we haven't really changed as much. See, the idea of the younger son is this. My family, the tradition behind my family, the religious tradition, all, every, all of those things are holding me back. And what my heart longs for more than anything else in the world is what? To be free of that. What do I need? I need money. So give me my money so that I can go be free, so that I can finally be happy. This sounds like most, mo <laughs> the attitude of most 18-year-olds when they graduate from high school and then they're going on their way to college. Finally, I have my money, I have, I have whatever, I'm going to go be free from my family and go exist outside, and that is finally where I will find my true happiness and purpose and identity. But it doesn't just stop there. This is a mindset that we have frequently. We talked about it several times over the past couple of weeks, so I won't belabor it. But our drive to be free, to experience freedom, to pursue the ideal of freedom, whether it's in materialistic goods or whether it's chasing some kind of nostalgia like, we will do it because we want to be free, and there's no better depiction of that, seriously, than the younger son here in Jesus' parable. He says, I'm going to go, and he begins to go. 
And not many days later, he says in verse 13, that the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey from to a far country, and then what did he do? Exactly what you expect him to do. He squanders everything with what? Reckless living. What in the world does reckless mean? I don't know. The, no, I'm kidding. I do know. But it just, it just I mean, that, so that's where the word prodigal comes from. So this is the prodigal son because he takes all of his inheritance and he re- he's reckless with it. He's worthless with it. He's reckless with what, all that he does, but he's in this constant pursuit of freedom because, again, behind freedom is what? The good life that he always wanted. But he has to strip himself of his family ties. He has to strip himself of the, their religious baggage, and then he can finally experience the good life that he wants. But it doesn't necessarily turn out that way, but we already know that. You could have never heard this story in your life, and you probably could, could surmise things are not going to end well for this cat. And guess what? You're right. They don't end well. Look at verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. This would have more impact in its original, to its original readers than it does to us. We can feel, certainly, him being poor, him hitting rock bottom, and we can feel that. Like, you had everything, you took it by evil and cold means, you squandered it, and now you're eating with the pigs. We can feel that. But from, for a primarily Jewish audience, this is not just, he's hit rock bottom. This is like, he is betraying all that being Jewish is. He's betraying all of the dietary reg- regulations and restrictions and being around these pigs. So this guy has not just betrayed his father or his own homeland. Now he's betraying the very God in which his family serves. He is completely isolating himself from his homeland, from his friends, from his family, and now the God in whom they worship. And as he's feeding these pigs, he is longing just for a taste of what they're eating because he squandered everything he had. He's acted like a fool. And now he finds himself a farmer to these pigs, so hungry, so desperate, he's willing to begin to eat what they're eating. And then what does he think of? Here is the tad bit of turn in the story. Because up until now, I mean, this is kind of just doom and gloom. But there's a tad bit of hope that begins to arise. What does he begin to think of as he has an honest moment of reflection wallowing with the pigs in the pig pen? He thinks about his father. He thinks about his father and he begins to long for his home. Look at verse 17. When he comes to himself, he says, how many of my father's hired servants have, have, have had more than enough bread? But here I am dying with hunger. He begins to think of his father. Why? Because what he's realizing is that his ideal of freedom that he was chasing turned out to be a mirage. Abandoning his family history, abandoning his family's religious history, all those things sounded good in the moment, but they've turned out to be not necessarily the greatest thing that's ever happened to him before. Because the freedom that he was pursuing, in fact, was not a prosperity donor, it was an enslaver. It took more and more and more and more from him till he had nothing, not even a sandwich. The freedom that he was pursuing was a faux freedom. It wasn't real. And it took everything without restraint, chewed him up, and spit him out. And so now he's thinking, there's only one hope that I have, and it's my father. I just want to go home. But let's be honest. Can he go home? You just told your dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my third of the inheritance. Can you just stroll back in in the house after that? But he makes it, he comes up with a plan. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan out a way in which I can come home. Look what he says in verse 18. I will rise, I'll go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I no longer am worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Do you hear his plan? What's his plan? That he's going to go home, he's going to start journeying for home, and he's going to focus on 
work on a very well-crafted apology. Does this sound familiar to you? Have you ever done this before? Have you ever done something terrible and you have to make a really good apology effort here? And so you, no, just me? Okay. He's going to craft the perfect apology and he's going to follow it up with a grand gesture. Father, let me come home, let me live here, but I will be your slave. I will work for you. I don't have to be your son. I have ruined that opportunity. I've closed that door. Just let me come work for you. Let me get out of this pigsty. Let me come back home. Let me just enjoy being at home. It's a wonderful plan. I mean, really, how, what, else, what else can he do? This is a pretty good plan that he has going for him. So he begins to go back home with the plan in mind. But what's so crazy about this story is that his plan absolutely does not work. It seems to be like a perfect plan. But it absolutely is foiled at every nook and cranny. Look at verse 20. As he begins to approach the father, or his home, he arose and he came to the father, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, watch this, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So he's going through his apology. Perfect. Watch this. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For the son was dead. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. As the younger son turns the corner to his house, But he is met by the stare of a father who merely sees the dusk picking up and is just hopeful that his boy has come home. And you can't know this for sure. We can't know this for sure. But I I think what we can know is this. I don't think the father's telepathic. I don't think the father just intuitively knew, oh, my son is coming home. Let Let me go embrace him. No, no, no. I think the father is watching for the son. Every day, every night, he sits at his kitchen nook window with his coffee or his beverage, looking out a massive window just in hopes that his boy will come home. And finally, he does. And here's the most breathtaking part about this entire story. You see, in the ancient world, you know, children run Ranchers run after their livestock. Moms run after their children so they don't get run over and they stay safe. Men of noble status do not run. They're too good for that. They're too high above that. They don't run. But this father runs. Because there is no amount of disgrace that this father is not willing to endure to miss the opportunity of embracing his son who was once dead, considered dead at all costs, but now has now come home. He doesn't care how the son smells. He doesn't care what the son has done. There are no questions asked. The son can't even finish his apology before the father is stripping himself of his own robe, putting on on his son's back, taking his own signet ring, which would signify his his familial seal, putting it on his finger, pronouncing publicly before everyone, this is my son. And he's come home. And now we need to celebrate. This is why the plan was absolutely foiled. He's not even able to get his apology out before the the father is already embracing him. Listen, as I read this, and I know maybe as you hear it as well, I'm just reminded of of times in my own life where I have pursued freedoms thinking this is what I really want. Like this is finally going to make my heart really happy and it just never turns out like that. It just doesn't. Because faux freedoms are are like, they're like garbage disposals. You put the food in there and it chews it up, throws it down the drain and it stays on, it stays running. Why? Because it's waiting for you to feed it more food. Faux dreams suck and pull all they can from us, and when they're done, they just chew us up and spit us out. 
And I think a lot of times when we hear this story, because it is so, it's so popular, I think a lot of times when we hear about the story of the prodigal son, we look back in our own lives and we look at ways in which we have failed and we have messed up and we've done things we're not proud of and we put our places, we put our, ourselves in positions where, we, where, where we're around things that we shouldn't be around or we're saying things that we shouldn't say or we're doing things that we shouldn't do. And, we, and just the idea, the plausibility of a God who is a good father is n- something that we don't feel like we could ever experience. True or not, I think if we're honest, it's just a hard pill to spot and swallow if we're honest about all of the things that we have done in our life that have been less than appealing. But here's what I want us to see. That there is no depth that you can crawl. There is no height you can fall. There is no amount of sin that you can commit that ever, ever disqualifies you from experiencing the embrace of a gracious, good God who is your Father. If there were such a time to prove otherwise, this would be that time. But that's absolutely not, as what, that's not what's occurring. The point of this first act is essentially to say there is no limit to God's infinite compassion as a good father. And he is always beckoning his children who are considered lost to come back home. He's waiting at the breakfast nook, looking out the window, waiting for the dust to fly so he can run to the sons and daughters that have, that have left or pursued any kind of freedom that just don't, don't ever, ever, ever add up to freedom. And usually that's the way in which we hear the story, that's the bulk of the story. But listen to me. Remember, this story is not about one son. It's about two sons. Remember Jesus' his first, his, his first, his first part. When he begins to introduce the story, what does he say? A father had a terrible son? No, he said a father had two sons. The second act concerns itself not with a reckless son, but actually a really, really good son. A son who decides to stick with his father through thick and thin. A son who knows his theology, knows his religion, and attempts to perform better than most people in the world. He's a good son. He's the son, if we're honest, we probably want. But the good son has a fatal error. In the second act, look at verse 25. He says, "Now, now his older son was in the field. So after the father's embrace of the younger son. Now this older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? And he said to them, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. The older son was angry. Why? Why? He's angry, and he refuses to go in. So his father, again, comes out to entreat him. Again, it's another instance of the father, who is the host of the party, leaving the party, taking an undignified position to come speak to his elder son. He goes to him. He entreats him. But he answered the father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? The older son is enraged that the father would accept this younger son back. And the the question is why? Why is he so mad? Other than the obvious things. I mean, obviously, he would consider his younger brother not a great human being. But it has to be more than that. What is driving his anger towards this younger brother of his? I think there's two things that's really driving it. And the first is this. The older brother lives by a very particular narrative. There's a story that plays over and over again in the older brother's head, and it's this. What I put into life, I will get out of life. The harder I work, the better I perform the more I will get out. As long as I'm a good person, good things will happen to me. Do any of these things sound familiar? 
this narrative plays in a lot of our heads all the time. The better I am, the better things will happen to me. Life is all about being good. But something is occurring here that doesn't calculate inside the older brother. His mathematical formula isn't working. I have been good. I have served you all these years. And now you're throwing a party for this loser coming home? And he's very angry about it. Because it's messing with what he really believes about the world. That's the first reason why I think he's so angry. The second is this, a lot more practical. Let's go back for a second about the inheritance. When the father gives away the inheritance to the younger son, because there's two boys, the oldest son would get two-thirds of the inheritance, most out of all the siblings. Why? Because he became the new patriarch, and he was responsible for taking care of the family. The, the successive sons, after the firstborn, would get a third of that, divided up equally, whatever that amount may be. When the father gives the inheritance to the younger son, remember, he has to also give the inheritance to the older son, which means what? The father owns nothing. So what we would consider this beautiful interaction between the father and younger son, when the father takes off his robe and puts it on the back of the, of the younger son, takes his ring off and puts it on and throws it at a huge party, whose money is actually being spent? It's the older son. The older son has worked very hard, very diligently. He's been a very good person. He believes all of those things are owed to me. How dare you take away what is mine and give it to this worthless individual? He doesn't even call him his brother. He says, your son. Did you notice that? That's why he's mad. It doesn't fit into the way he views the world. And now you're getting personal. You're messing with my money. And now we have a problem. And so the massive big fat question is this. How is the older brother going to respond? Because watch how Jesus ends this parable. So breathtakingly brilliant. And if you're a teacher, just admire the, the pedagogy of Jesus. Watch, watch what he does in verse 31. And he says to them, or he said to him, so the father speaking to the older son, Son, you're always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. And the story stops. The curtain drops on Act 2. The story's over. Jesus is done. If we zoom back out for a second, there are still people around Jesus in real time waiting to hear the conclusion. Why is there no conclusion? Because the thin veil of fiction and reality is being broken before their very eyes. Jesus, in a very real way, is already addressing the younger son and the older son. And what Jesus is doing through the story of the prodigal son is begging the older sons, the Pharisees, to respond with compassion that God the Father himself has. And he's just waiting for them to respond. He just drops it right there. So how do they respond? Well, Jesus' story has no ending. But if I may, we do know the ending of the story. You see, using the characters in the story, what happens? The father talks to the older brother. The older brother gets very angry. And then what happens? Essentially, the older brother goes and gets his friends, and they bust in the party, and they grab the father, and they pull him out, and they beat him, and they lash him, and they put him on a cross, and they watch him breathe his last breath. Because there is no way that they're going to allow a person to deal with what they think is true about the world, about being a good person, and messing with their inheritance that only belongs to them. All the while, God has a much bigger plan at stake in what's going on. You know, one of the biggest surprises I think about the story, the more I've read this and the more it just sticks out to me, is really this. It's, it's asking this question. Whose responsibility is it to go and find the younger brother? I mean, he just demands his inheritance, takes it, and then leaves. Like, there's no, is there someone who's supposed to go get him? And the answer is yes. It's, a res it's the responsibility of guess who? The older brother. 
It's the responsibility of the older brother to go find the younger brother and to bring him back home to talk sense into him, to restore the family. That's why he gets the larger inheritance. But unfortunately for this younger brother in Jesus' story, his, his older brother is cold and mean and hateful and despises his, his younger brother and wants everything for himself. And see, in a very real way, I think oftentimes in different seasons of our life, we can identify with these characters, maybe some more, maybe, maybe different characters more at a time. Maybe you're the freedom person where you really feel like if I can have this or if I could go here, if I could detach myself from all, these, all of these traditions and religions and things like that, then I could finally experience a good life. But then other people are saying, no, 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 the, the key to a good life is by being good by performing well. And as long as I'm performing at the top of my game, in my job, in my, in my hobbies, around my family, then I will be a good person. I'll experience a good life. But what all of us have in common essentially is this. There was a point in time in which all of us acted like younger brothers to the good father himself. We all did. We all looked at his reign and his rule and we said, we don't want any of that. We will achieve the good life through performance or we'll achieve it through freedom and we went away. But here's the power of the story of the gospel, the good news, that unlike the younger brother in the parable, we don't have a brother, we have an older brother who is very different. Jesus himself comes as our older brother, and what does he do? He leaves his throne in heaven, comes to earth, identifies as a human being to do what? to chase us down as we're wandering away. He chases us down until he seeks and finds us. Why? Because that's what good brothers do. And Jesus is so good at it. He does it even to the point of giving up his own life that we might be spared. That the sins we commit could be placed on him and his perfect righteousness could be given to us so that God in a real way could look at us out the window and say, that's my son, that's my daughter, all because of what Jesus, our elder brother, does on our behalf. That's the difference. We have a good older brother. So what do we do with all this stuff? I think this is is what we do. I think this is where we go. Everything, everything, that's how important it is to understand the value to be had by knowing God as a good father. It really does change everything. It changes every fabric of our being. It means that regardless of the triumphs and failures of our, earth, of our earthly fathers, that we still have a father who is infinitely perfect in every regard of protecting, providing, and playing with us. And we can still experience an infinite amount of joy and satisfaction and beauty by trusting him, by knowing him. Because of what Jesus has done for us, Because here's the thing, he gives us an identity that is so secure and so not based on our own performance, but based on his, which is perfect and gracious. And we can be known and we can know him and be known by him in a very real, tangible way. And here's the thing, the more this impassions us, and this is where I get so excited about this text, Because the more I read it, the more I get excited about it, the more that I become both characters, depending on the season, and see how how the Father responds to me, the more that begins to impassion my soul, the more I find myself displaying the same compassion to other people. The hardest thing for most people when they read this story is they're thinking, well, this is how God wants me to act to people? Some people just don't deserve this. I'm not going to act like that. Which is true. We're not wired to act like this to other people. But do you know what helps move the needle forward? By knowing how compassionate God has been towards you. Until we know deeply, intimately how compassionate he's been to us, we can't be compassionate for other people. Know him, trust him. He is the good elder brother who has made a way possible for us. The more beautiful this becomes, the more we're able to have compassion on other people because of the compassion that God has had on us. Because God is a good, 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 good father.
Let's pray. Father, I love this story so much. It is, it has changed everything. Father, I thank you for Jesus and him being a good elder brother, one that gives his own life for us, gives it on our behalf that we might know you. Father, we thank you that you have made yourself so clearly known. Father, we thank you for all of your attributes and the way that you have revealed them to us. We pray that we would be a community of people that are mindful of those and that worship you in spirit and in truth and invite others who are near you and far from you to come join along with us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.